So hello everybody, I'm Gloria Gonzalez Fuster. It's the first time I'm at this conference and I'm pretty amazed by the broad uh, sessions that you have. So I'm, 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 lucky. I'm happy to see that you're all still alive because you had really two very different presentations, like very concrete and very abstract, and then we will move to something a bit still different. Uh, yes, and it's perhaps not the, the most cheerful presentation because it's about death, uh, but uh, it's, um, mm -hmm. so yes, it's a, it's a presentation about data and, 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 and death, and it's, uh, I was supposed to present with a colleague who could not make it, he's still alive, he's doing fine, but uh, I don't know why he, he could not make it. And the, the only good thing is that I know we started the day talking also uh, about death, so in a way it's a, there's a continuity and, and a sort of um, uh, conclusion or something like this, but there's still an, another keynote. So, uh, yes, the introduction is basically about uh, me and uh, my co-author, uh, Rocco Bellanova is at the University of Amsterdam. He's a political scientist, I think, he's into international relations, which is something very mysterious, but he does uh, critical security studies and this kind of things. And I'm personally basically a legal scholar. I'm most of the time working on European Union law, specifically data protection law, so the law of uh, data protection. I know uh, not everybody loves data protection law. In the uh, keynote of this morning, again, there were some references like privacy, data protection law, these are individualistic things that yeah, we don't like them, and, and these kind of things. Uh, Rocco Bellanova, in this international relations uh, kind of little planet, he respects the fact that I like data protection law. Um, I think he deals a lot with data security practices. So, so actually, we have been working together for a long time precisely on this, this intersection between data security practices and data protection law. What do, what do we do with, how do we understand data when, when we look at data from the perspective of data security and uh, data protection or something like this? I will try to explain this. Uh, basically, I will present this something about uh, death and data. I'm talking about data being uh, dead, but it basically it's about the, the possibility that we, we think about how death plays a role in our understanding, uh, in the functioning of data. This is a paper that we have not written yet, uh, but I, I will try to convince you, to convince me that we should write it. Uh, so that, try to convince you that it makes sense to think about this notion of death in data, and we have tried to convince other people, and they have told us, ah, oh, death, 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 you really have to mention death. So, uh, I don't know if I have to mention death, so please tell me, if maybe there's another synonym that it's um, more neutral or something like this. So we have been working together uh, for a long time, and, and there's a, there's a, uh, if you manage to read all these papers, uh, I will just offer you plenty of, of wine. Uh, so we have been working together, and, and I will try to briefly summarize, but I actually have plenty of time, what we have been trying to do uh, over uh, during these years, especially because Rocco is not here, so I can pretend I know what we are doing, and he cannot uh, contest this. But, so there are, there, are, there are actually some papers that we have written. Uh, that's to reassure you. We started thinking about privacy uh, law and data protection law from a really the very uh, basic legal perspective, because in European Union law there's privacy, there's data protection, these are different things, and we tried to explain to everybody that we were interested in data protection law, and they said, ah, privacy, and we said, no, data protection law, and, and we tried to understand why, how could we think about this fact that whenever we mention data protection law, privacy is still relevant. And we used a uh, philosopher, Jacques Derrida, and the idea of the specters of things, you know, this is a very popular thing, uh, he stole it from, from Marx, that there are ghosts in things, so you, you are, you're looking into something and actually you, you can see something that it's not there, but operates there somehow. And privacy for us was functioning like this, was haunting data protection law. We tried to talk about data protection law, but people said, yes, 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 it's privacy. And it was there without being there. So we, we were thinking about this, and this question of the ghost, and you see ghost, I'm trying to take you to, to the death subject. And, 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 and so that's, that's what, where we started. So we started to, to think about spectrality and haunt, haunting things and disappearance. And perhaps the, the, the research that we did that is perhaps useful for, for you is this uh, a paper that we wrote on body scanners. So you remember body scanners? You know this, this body scanners uh, thing? And specifically, what was interesting for us about body scanners was the moment where these body scanners were legalized in Europe, thanks to data protection law. So we were actually critical of data protection law, saying how it enables things to happen. Why? Because originally this uh, technology was actually sort of camera that really pictured bodies doing, uh, and uh, you could see the naked body passing through, through a, a place. 
there was some reaction and they said, well, instead of bodies, we will not see bodies, we will see this, which is not a body, which is a body, which is a figure of somebody that we don't even know who they are. They claim this was not personal data of anybody and therefore everything was compliant with the law, with data protection law, with everything. So we were interested in how this conjunction of a surveillance technology and, and, some, and some legal mechanism created this little space in an airport. You know, in the airport, everybody knows who you are, what you're doing, but suddenly you were passing through a little door and, and nobody knew who you were, nobody saw you. You, you disappear in this, in this little box and then you, you appear afterward. So we tried to explain this in a paper. We went to, to conferences like this one and very often we were placed in the feminist uh, track. And then in the feminist track, because we, we mentioned body scanners, you know, the, perhaps it's an algorithm saying, ah, body, put them in the feminist track. And then people ask us, ah, what about the body and the embodiment and all this? And we, and we say, oh, no, we don't see any bodies. The, the, the magic of these things is that there is no body, there is no, no, no one, there is nothing. And so we had a lot of uh, discussions with, with the feminist perspectives. So I was hoping that today actually the feminist data perspective was really a sort of feminist discussion that we could have without the body but I still um, think we're still not there, we, we're always coming back to the body. And uh, one of the magic things about data and data protection is that really bodies can disappear and data subjects can disappear. So I think we, we have to think uh, about this. After this, uh, we actually move into obscenity, which we, we thought this was going to sell a lot of uh, papers. And here, this notion of the obscene is, is, is not related really to the obscene in the sense of things being obscene, but uh, because we both have this uh, Latin background, we really thought about the obscene as something that's obscene in the sense that it's out of the scene. And why did we think this was interesting? It was because we were thinking about visibility. So remember, disappearance, things that are there but disappear, you no longer see them, but somehow they are, they are a specter, you don't really see them. And this question of the obscene is something that it's so visible that actually it gets, has to be put out of the scene. So something, when you do something obscene, you have to disappear, and you disappear, but you don't really, you're not really away, because if you're there, you have been put there. So you, you are somehow still there, but you have been put away. So there was something interesting about this uh, notion of the obscene uh, that was about these paradoxes of being there, but you have to be visible, but somehow, sometimes you have to be invisible, and I think, again, feminism is it's very useful for this. There are some visibilities that are blind, some visibilities that are, that are imposed, so there are many things that could be discussed there. So we, we, we were working on this, and uh, yes, we actually moved to the, this, the last paper that we actually wrote, which is about computing and composting. And uh, this is because we were starting to think, so we, with the previous one, yes. Uh, I think really here we, we like, uh, exhausted all possible metaphors about visibility. You know, there are millions of things about the panopticon, the panopticon, the, the, of the opticons of the planet, the gaze and, and the visible and the invisible. We, we, we made all the, all the puns that you can make, all the workplace, and we thought, but well, we need some new metaphors and probably there's a general agreement that we have to move beyond this question of surveillance being about surveillance and looking into things. So how can we think about surveillance in a different way. And, and we thought really data actually, the, the surveillance through data, it's a different type of, of surveillance. So we need to think differently and we started to move to the question of sound. So perhaps with sound, thinking about the, the relation between sound, computing, surveillance, we can think about, uh, better about all this or at least write different types of papers. So we, we, we started to think about composition because composition in, 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 in many other fields and in, in has uh, different uh, conceptual uh, implications. And so we started to think about data security practices as composition and this question of uh, how do you assemble things with different elements. And thinking about composition, uh, uh, so there are different things that are useful for us. One of the things is really how this data functions as an element to be composed with other things. And one of the ways in which it functions and, and, and is really uh, this, uh, I think it, uh, data is assembled with other things through the things that data does not show. So again, the things that are invisible in, in data. But also one of the things that we try to develop there is, is we, we jump to this uh, notion of composting, you know, it's Haraway. And, and this composting is really that we thought that the data are actually, you compose with data because data decompose themselves. Why? So, you know, basically the, most of our data security practices are about taking data that were collected for something and then reusing this data for something else. 
So you have data that you use to, to call your grandmother, and this data will be then reappear to be for profiling purposes, for, for to make sure that you're not a risk for, for society. They will be used uh, in the context of law enforcement. So there are many, actually, many measures, data retention. Uh, now we have some e-evidence uh, proposals to make sure that data that were collected for something become a security thing that plays with other security measures. So we thought this idea of composting, of regeneration of data was, was uh, really useful. And we did all this actually with the help of a Japanese uh, composer who is Ryoji Ikeda. He, he did not help us, but we visited the, the exhibition and he has interesting installations about data. And actually it's, it's about the sound of data and also the visuals around data. And this is one example of the, of the, of the types of things he does. You see data everywhere. You see data doing things and, and it's, it was a very, uh, physical experience of how can you actually uh, think about data through these different perceptions of data, or just imagining uh, somebody's looking into something and seeing you in, in a sort of way. So we really try to think uh, data from this perspective and then using this notion of composting and, and the different um, realities of data. So really this idea of data decaying and, and dying and, and, and re, re, being resurrected, it's, it's uh, linked to this idea of the many lives of data. Data have to be used for, for many other purposes. This is the favorite uh, subject of, of Rocco. This is the PNR uh, systems, passenger name record systems. That's the data when the, you, you produce when you fly somewhere. And these data are collected to, to commercial uh, uh, software then used for security purposes, for profiling, for, for many things. And, and you can really see how this data moves in a way um, without actually moving, because I have to say, we have been really uh, struggling with this question of the metaphors of, of that we use for data. One of the, the issues is data and the visual uh, imagery. And for me, another important issue is also the, the, the metaphors that we use for the transfer of data. The transfer of data, we have, uh, this is PNR, uh, so normally data are transferred from uh, the European Union to the United States. And I always try to convince people that data are never transferred. Data are never transferred. So when I transfer something, if I'm transferring this there, I will transfer this, yes? You follow me? Yes? Yes? Did I transfer this? Is the bottle here? Is the bottle here? No. When I transfer this kind of data from here to there, the data will be here, but the data will be here. Yes? So there's no transfer of data. It doesn't exist. You multiply data. You, you recreate data somewhere else. You have new data appearing, but you don't really transfer data. So data indeed have many, many, many lives. And what we are now trying to explain is that they can only have those, these many lives because they are, have many deaths, because they disappear, because they, they actually constantly uh, dying, and this is where I actually come into to what I wanted to explain. This idea that actually we can think of, of data as, as dying uh, constantly, and this, I believe, has a sort of uh, coherence with actually the technicality of, of how this works in practice. So, so data are kept alive somehow, but uh, in, in the, it's not that they are there uh, not moving, they are reproduced constantly, so they are there. For, from the perspective of law enforcement, when, when you want to preserve data, you say you freeze data. And it's really like um, when you want to preserve somebody who died, no? hoping that in, in, in two centuries you can unfreeze the person and they will recover. But the data is the same. You freeze the data and you say, well, we'll come back to the data at some point. So technically, data are all the time about to die. You have to keep them uh, somehow alive. And, and I think uh, also this question, coming back again to, to the data, has a sort of semiotic uh, uh, dimension. Many people talk about data being traces of, of the data subject, traces of the people, but so in a way, yes, but we can also think of data as having traces of, of other things. And with these traces, this is how we, we compose with, with uh, other things. So uh, yes, data are dead all the time. Data are dying all the time. This is what I, I'm trying to say. Uh, how are we going, what are we going to do with this? What's the, the point? Uh, I don't know. So one of the points is that I think that's useful, but we can also try to think uh, about data as, as an event. So it's not that data are dying because actually they, 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 they are just an event that happens that we can reproduce in many ways. Now trying to, to just say what can we do with this. Uh, for me, one of the things that I find interesting precisely from the perspective of data protection law is the question of transparency. So you, you know transparency. 
one of the principles of transparency is that people are getting your data, but at some point you get your data back, yes? So now I'm moving away from security, and I, because I'm not a computer scientist, I'm not uh, anything, I do this kind of drawings to explain things. So you know uh, the data subjects, you know this is us, the individuals, and you know that data controllers, those who get the data from us, uh, uh, will take this data, and I think from a critical uh, data perspective, we have uh, given a lot of attention to the fact that this data is not a natural thing, it's not a raw thing, that it's a, the data are not collected as such, it's a sort of construction, but at some point, from a legal perspective, we lose track, tra tra track of this fact, and then we claim our data back. Our data were just an event, so we are providing data in a sort of an event, and indeed, thanks to data protection law, thanks to the law, you can at some point claim claim your data back, and then I think it's useful for me to remember at this point that this data that I'm getting back is just another event of something. It has a sort of relation with some data that I gave, but the data that I gave are dead. My data were just uh, something, and now what I get is another event of data, another sort of recreation of something that may have some connection with the data that, that I was given. So I think it really can help us uh, think through all these uh, data security practices, but in general, our relation with, with data. And basically, uh, that's very much it. Thank you.